Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Farside Co-Ed Books Club. We are celebrating World Book Day, even though it was on yesterday. We're celebrating today, and we're going to talk about our favorite books. Uh, we're going to talk about our favorite authors. We're going to talk about books that we have. I wish we could really show all the books that we have, but we wouldn't have time to do all that. But um, we pull some of our favorites out and we're just going to begin to talk about why we love them, the name of the book, the genre of the book, and just whatever just comes to mind. So please join the conversation. Go get your books. Um, your favorite beverage. I did say a beverage. Mine is tea, peppermint tea. So let's begin. Okay. So I guess I'll start. All right. Um, one of my favorite authors, and I actually started when I was went to graduate school. Um, I went and let me give a shout out, Clark Atlanta University. Uh, so I went to graduate school there in '91, and uh, one of the classes that I took was uh, African American women's literature. And so the teacher or the professor, I should say, uh, introduced me to this wonderful woman. And her name is Tina McElroy Ansa. I love this woman. This was the first book that I read from her called Baby of the Family. I read this book in one night. I sat up and I felt like she literally was living in my home because I felt like I was the baby of the family. Um, it's about a young girl that she is, well, her name is Lena McPherson, first of all. And um, she's, she's one of these women that, the little, the little girl, I should say, she's, she's born with a call over her face. So, you know, if you know anything about history, about how in black families may tell you that a call, you've been born with a call over your face, that means you have special gifts. That means that you have uh, insight into another realm. And so what they do is that they, the nurse uh, takes her, the nurse and the grandmother, they take her call and they bury it. And then they also take it a part of it and drink it as a tea. So as she's growing up, she sees things. She hears things. She has this type of um, insight. She's that little girl that, you know, you would, you would see sit in the corner. And she wouldn't be saying anything, but she understood every adult conversation going on in the room. And so that's who she is. She's that little girl that um, she's a special child. And she does, she sees ghosts, she predicts the future. Um, she has all of these, she's an old spirit, as, as the old folks would say, she's an old spirit. And so I identify greatly with her because I grew up, my grandmother raised me, and I was that little girl that can see things and people would be like okay so what she's talking about what she's seeing um i was that little girl that actually saw her grandfather who died six months before she was born i was two years old and just a little short story uh, my mother was in the kitchen and she was cooking and so she heard me in the uh dining room talking and so she said Lana, she said, who are you talking to? And so I said, talking to granddaddy. And so she was like, no, your granddaddy died before you were born. I said, no, I'm talking to granddaddy. And so she said, what does he have on? And I described to her everything that he had on, literally, and even down to the very color of his eyes. My grandfather was actually the, the son of a slave owner, his own slave owner. And my grandfather was very dark and he had gray eyes. And I described everything. I described his, his spit, his had a, a spittoon because he loved chewing tobacco. And I described his rocking chair. I described everything. So my mother ran out the house and left me inside the house. <laughs> and she waited outside till her mother, my grandmother came home from work. 
And so my grandmother said, what are you doing out here? So she said, she told her, she said, your granddaughter is in there talking to your dead husband. <laughs> so I identified so much with this little girl because this was me. This was, I was Lena. And Tina McElroy and Anza write some of the most beautiful books that I've ever seen. So I'm going to take this book with me forever because I mean, I met and I met Miss uh, Miss Anza as well. And so she was able to sign um, to sign my books. And she put a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, passage in here. And she said, for Lana, my sister of the call, be blessed, love and peace. Tina McElroy and Anza. And that was July 21st, 2005, Atlanta. And I will forever, ever cherish this book, along with her other books that she did sign as well. But this is the beginning for me. So that's my first book. OK, Monica, your turn. <laughs> OK, and being in education, um, I'm an elementary um, speech language pathologist. So I spend a lot of time in engaging in elementary literature. So one of my favorites was one written by Queen Latifah. Yay. And this is entitled Queen of the Scene. And this one, I love it because not just because it comes with like a CD along kind of a bop with it, um, but this one was actually gifted to me. Um, by my uh, by my school and so all the teachers i was actually leaving and transitioning um, school systems and districts and was moving and so my, the staff you know signed is not you know instead of the typical yearbook this is the book that they gave me and what i like about it it it's just the artwork is amazing. Um, Frank Morrison is the illustrator. So you'll, I mean, just the images of um, the children, just diverse images. Um, it's one of those empowering stories. You just look, you know, little girl's hair. Um, just I'm as smooth as a machine because I'm the queen <laughs> of the sea. You don't want to race me. I'm as fast as spinning dice. If it looks like I'm just catching up, I'll really pass you twice. <laughs> so, I mean, you just get these powerful images of kids at play. Um, just, you know, understanding a little girl proud and confident in who she is. If you had a genie that would grant you a wish, you'd want to hoop like me when I shoot you here, swish. <laughs> so just, you know, given just a powerful image, beautiful image of young childhood and being, you know, confident in who you are. So this is what, like one of my uh, favorites and another one, which is also um, the artwork was by Frank Morrison, but another um, a woman, African-American woman author, and that Queen of the Scene, of course, by Queen Latifah, and then My Feet Are Laughing mm. um, by Lisette Norman, and this one just talks about um, movement, and this was, I didn't realize this was another transition book. Um, <laughs> Because I look, have all look all these staff signatures, um, where you know. So my my sister Julie is six years old and copies everything I do. If I say I like pink dresses, she says I like them too. My <laughs> sister Julie wants to know why I can't sit still and my hand is always tapping. She asked me why I squirm in my seat, and I said because my feet are laughing. Julie asks a thousand questions. It's hard to stop her once she starts. When I beg her to be quiet, she says, asking questions makes me smart. So you've got just different, different poems about different aspects of love, life, um, something about her hair, 
um, love being a lot of things, um, bed bugs, um, having doing chores, the tooth fairy, you know, just like this beautiful mother daughter image right there. Mm -hmm. so just, these are the stories that you read aloud. I mean, you have the rhythm and you have the rhyme. Um, and just, you know, from just from just routine chores and living life and having a sibling and just being, you know, just normal being of a young child. So those are my two, you know, elementary favorites. So I'll I'll give it to you to to go next, <laughs> go back go back to you next. Okay, okay. Well, I know I've been talking about Tina. I can't help it because I love Tina McGill Run Answer. Even though there are other authors that I do love, I think her books resonate with me because they bring up family. They bring up um, the family, of course, in the South. Um, Mulberry, Georgia. It's a fictional place, but it's it's one of those places where anybody can identify, no matter where you're from. And it's it. Other her other books are um. Well, let me see. Ugly ways. Ugly ways. And I'm gonna just kind. I'm just gonna kind of show them all. So this one is you know better. Take it after my dear. And then this one was the hand that I fan with. Um, again, it's about a mother, what they call my dear. She has three girls and um, my dear dies. And I don't want to give all of it away because if you have, if you've never read her books, I really would I encourage you to go get them because you can identify with this my dear person. This my dear is, she raises her girls, even though she has a husband, she, she raises her girls to be very self-sufficient. In fact, they start doing the duties of her, um, taking care of the household as little bitty girls. And they can't understand why she just stopped making breakfast and you know, doing their hair and cleaning and all that kind of stuff. They literally take over the household and they, you know, they just they just start doing all of her duties. But um how Tina approaches the girls is that she looks at them, even though they're sisters, she gives them all a, a very unique personality and a very unique perspective of their mother. And Lena is always, she's the oldest girl. And so she is the one who kind of keeps the other two in line. So the baby girl, eventually all of them will end up going and doing other things. And so Melina stays in Mulberry. And so uh, my dear dies. <laughs> and I'm just gonna kind of kind of giving you a, a backdrop of it. But she doesn't necessarily go away. Uh, she hears the girls conversations. Uh, she's like this spirit that's still here. Um, and again, it's one of those series of, of books that um, being raised by my grandmother, they I, I, I was just endeared to them because it was like sitting with my grandmother and hearing her and her friends have these conversations. And so it, it brings up, her books remind me of those conversations. It also has in there uh, the talk of the South, the way that uh, people look at things, you know, um, the type of insight that they have uh, into other people's homes, you know, the language that, you know, that uh, old Southern mothers would have. Uh, so Tina, uh, to me, is one of those authors that, like I said, is, is, is she, she really goes into the Southern history and the Southern story of, of Black people. And she takes, like I said, she, she takes these three girls and even though they have a very different perspective of their mother, they eventually have to come to grips with that's just who the mother was. And so even though they are, some, they're angry, 
at one point because they didn't get really a chance to say what they wanted to say. So now they're saying things about her in her death. But she's like I said, she's a spirit, so she still hears them. Um, they have to come into their own and find themselves. It's really it's really a, a identity book because they got so lost in who a dear was, and 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 they never really got a chance to express themselves like they really wanted to. So it's coming into their identity. It's, it's also taking charge of their life without having Madeir be that voice in the back of their heads that uh, rules and guides them. And so uh, one of the books that um, both Monica and I love is The Hand I Fan With. Uh, <laughs> that book was really about Lena and how she had to break away from being the big sister and really finding love for her and finding herself. You know, here she was, she owned a, a, a beauty salon. You know, she did hair for the people in the, in the town. And, you know, she was, she was really a very good businesswoman. But it was always taken care of, taken care of, because everybody called on Lena. Lena was this, Lena, Lena, Lena do this, you know. And so she had to find herself. So what happens is her and a friend conjure up a, a spirit and it's a man. And <laughs> so through this spirit, she finds who she is because he loves her. And she and she she's never felt that type of love from a man. She's never felt that type of um being seen as a woman. He's always been seen as a big sister, the one who takes care of everybody, but never seen as a woman. And it's so funny that it has to be a spirit from, you know, back in the 1800s that comes and he sees her and he really falls in love with her. And she's just like, why couldn't it really be a real person? But she has these experiences with him and but at the same time, though, she she literally finds it's like the little girl in her from Medea, the adult, the, 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 the woman who takes care of the sisters to the adult woman through this experience with this spirit, she finds herself. And I wish that Miss, Miss Ansel would just <laughs> write some more of these books because Lord knows it's it was really just it again reading it almost in one night you just you, you can't put it down because she addresses so many issues i think that black women go through we wear so many hats and then you know when it's time for us to have our own voice we don't know the our own voice because we were speaking through so many other other um faces and other voices so it's a it's really an identity for I mean it's really a book about just finding your your authentic identity and loving who you are in spite of even your past experiences, things that you've had to take on, different you know, duties that you've had to take on, whether you wanted to or not, but really coming coming into your own. So I suggest these books, like I said, it's ugly ways. And in the order, it would be Baby of the Family, Ugly Ways, You Know Better, Taking After Medea, and then The Hand I Fan With. And so if you read them in that order, it'll make so much more sense. Not saying that you can't read them as standalones, but I think if you just read them in order, it, it, it makes the story much, much more full and richer for you. So those are my books by Tina. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> huh? It's hard to follow up with heavy hitting. <laughs> well, come on, because I know you got you got some. So come okay. on. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to um, do the like a um, upper elementary and level, and this first one is one crazy summer, and this is by Rita Gar Williams Garcia. Um, as you know, she's a, a Coretta Scott King Award winner, which by that sticker right there. Um, she was a national book um, finalist for that. And she also received a Caldecott honor for this book. Um, so this um, chronicles um, a family in transition, 
um, the father sends the girls, um, his, um, um, the girls, Delphine, who's 11, and her two younger sisters um, from Brooklyn to Oakland, California um, during the summer. Well, this summer is the summer of 1968. Um, so if you think historical-wise as to what was happening um, po politically, the racial unrest, um, riots, and all those kinds of things, um she um this um scene arrives the summer of 68 um cecile who's the mother wants really nothing to do with the kids she makes them eat chinese takeout dinners forbids them to enter the kitchen and never explains the strange visitors with afros and black berets who knock on her door okay <laughs> so rather than spend time with them she sends them to a summer camp sponsored by a revolutionary group, the Black Panthers, where the girls get a radical new education. Okay. So that is one crazy summer. And she follows this one up with a crazy summer in Alabama. So that's sending, you know, how we send our kids down to grandma, grandma. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Over the summer. Over the summer. Over the summer. Another mm -hmm. upper elementary read. Um, of course, the upper elementary. These are chapter books. Mm -hmm. So that means no pictures, y'all. No pictures. <laughs> so you got to use your imagination and everything. But this is written by Octavia Spencer, um, the actress Octavia Spencer, who has. You've seen her in movies, you've seen her in television series, but she is also a noted um, author. And so this is a cross between um, Bruce, Bruce Lee meets Ch Jackie Chan meets Nancy Drew all <laughs> in this whole you know, series about um, ninja detective. All right, and this, this particular one is the case um, the sweetest heist in history. So this is like Randy Rose and her best friend Dario Cruz and Pudge Taylor have earned their places as Deer Creek's favorite ninja detectives. So now they're in New York City and their crime fighting instincts are on high alert. They're 12 priceless jewels. And so while visiting um, Randy's aunt in Brooklyn, the trio noticed some a suspicious looking characters casing the museum across the street, a museum with this ex exhibit of all of these precious jewels that Fabergé eggs. Anybody has ever seen mm -hmm. um, Fabergé egg worth millions. So this is the historic mystery that they are going to solve for this. Once there were 50 eggs and now they keep vanishing so they can't let it they can't let it go. So okay. this is Octavia Spencer's Ninja Detectives. All right. And it is a it is a series. So okay. you, know, you want to uh, pick that up. So those are two your upper elementary, like fifth grade, um, fifth grade, middle school, um, sixth grade, going to sixth grade um, reads. So I'm going to transition to two high school reads. To high school reads, and this one is written by Elizabeth Acevedo, mm -hmm. well, um, African American, Latin American um, author um, with the fire on high. This is um, which um, navigates trying to figure out your giftings and your strengths and purpose and what do you want to do mm -hmm. um, in life and trying to make um, tough you know, decisions, and then finding, um, this particular young girl finds her gifting with cooking. Okay. And, and um, okay. she's in the kitchen, um, and she's creating, you know, and she's, you know, tr trying not to play by the rules. She's tired of playing by the rules and trying to discover, um, you know, what she wants to do in life. And um, 
and that's the kitchen is the place where she can find herself and mm -hmm. create and you know dream of all of these different things that she wants to do and be and what can be possible so check it out with the fire on high now if you watched if you ever got to see the hate you give which was a book made movie by angie thomas um she follows that with her book called on on the come up which chronicles um the follows the story of a daughter of like a underground hip-hop legend and she's trying to find her own voice and her own her own path and then she ends up in the middle of some controversy <laughs> so definitely a great um great read uh, for your high schoolers and it's a high interest um one of the things i like about angie what she does is how she develops characters how she makes uses a language that is relevant um, to her characters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it sounds like your friends talking in high school, what, what your conversations were like, cause they weren't sounding like, you know, all professional and academic as, you know, we may be sounding right now, but they're relevant to, they speak the way they mm -hmm. speak, you know, and they're comfortable in it. They dress the way they dress. They, you know, they've got their swag, they've got their style. And you see that in all of her characters, um, you see the tension, um, you, you see, you get the feeling, you can place yourself in the situation and think about things you would do, how you would approach something if you were in the situation um so all of these different things you see the rising and fall in action like we talk about when we're telling about writing a story mm -hmm. you know you see all of that in the way that she writes so you definitely want to get that book along with she has a new book that she co-wrote um with um nick stone i believe and that one is called and that just dropped recently if i remember right um concrete rose so definitely check out Nick Stone mm -hmm. and Angie Thomas because these are phenomenal um, young adult authors, the women of YA, and um, they've really uh, made their niche. Okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Let me see. Um. I, I saw this young man actually on Facebook several years ago and I started following him. And then for a while I stayed off Facebook. But in the meantime, he wrote a book. His name is Derek Jackson and it's called Don't Forget Your Crown. And I've been reading it. I'm not finished yet, but I've been reading it. But it just, it, and, I, and I'm purposely drawing it out because it's one of those books that you really want to sit down and highlight, think about, write down your thoughts. He takes you on a journey in his life when he met a young lady that he really liked. And, and just to kind of give you a backdrop, he's a um, relationship expert in a sense. Um, but he talks about how he had to go on a journey within himself to find a, that place in him that where he would stop um, taking his taking women for granted and also growing up with um, different type of culture idioms that men tell young men, like if you haven't had sex, by the, by, like they always ask, you got a girlfriend, you know, by the, by the time you're 13, um, you know, have you had sex yet? You know, that kind of thing. And so black men grow up with these, um, I guess, lessons, I guess, or or words from other old, from older black men. But what, it hap what happens is that when you get to a certain age, those things don't work. 
those those type of idioms don't work. Those type of uh, thought and belief systems don't work. And so what happened was he met a young lady in college that he really did like. But because he was battling within himself uh, to grow up and to also find himself. And he was looking for the answer to the question about why is it so difficult for men to be faithful and to help him understand um, how he can um, overcome serious relationship deficits. And so he gives you examples. And, and, and what I like also about him is that even some of the women, as he was going on his journey, he met, uh, he was actually dating some women, but some of those women, he ended up giving them advice and ended up giving them sound wisdom uh, because of all the mistakes that he had made. And he was really wanting to, you know, to change because he didn't want to stay that type of man to where he couldn't, be, you know, remain faithful in a relationship. He wanted to be that man that was faithful, that he wanted to dispel that, you know, well, you know, men, men gonna do what men gonna do. No, no, that's not true. And, and, and he really talks about that. He says, it's always choices that you make, especially if you are wanting to become that man that wants to settle down, have a family. Um, before you even think about doing that, go inward, go inward and really begin to um, soul search begin to, 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 to dissect those things that you've been taught growing up or those things you may have seen on television, those things that depict a black man and go inside and really understand who you are as a person and what is needed and what's, and what's no longer needed in your life to believe. And I like the fact that I'm, I just want to read just a little bit of it. He says, a man who takes inventory on himself before he seriously pursues a woman solves that issue. Not a man who has no, no options. A woman banking her unbroken heart on a lack of opportunities for her man to cheat instead of, instead of on a man who's done the work on himself so that no matter what opportunity there is to cheat, he doesn't pass on the opportunity to keep his commitment. It's, it's, I'm sorry, on, his, on the opportunity to keep his commitment is setting herself up for failure. A woman who requires a man to know how his past relationships, childhood, and broken relationships with his parents affected him doesn't guarantee success, but drastically increases the chances. So does intentionally working towards a relationship with, with this mindset instead of just going with the flow and having the courage to recognize, then stopping the indulgence of commonly ignored vices while still in their primitive stages. Learning where I personally stood in the matrix of not cheating sounds unnecessarily complicated for someone who's never had that ever, ever had the issue, but it unlocked emotional health. I thought I'd never experienced, like going to see a chiropractor for a back pain that persisted for years and having it vanish after one visit. Self-examining and tying up loose ends where strands dangled for years finally rid me of the chronic desire to have someone around me who loved me and showed no signs of leaving. I didn't have to, to self-inflict the reopening of that wound anymore, looking for someone else to help me cope. And it was the most liberating feeling I'd ever experienced. After I read that, I sat back and I really thought about how we make decisions of in relationships of wanting somebody to fulfill a deficit that is inside of us and it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So I really encourage any young man, young woman, and I don't care what age you are, to be honest with you, get this book. It's called Don't Forget Your Crown. And even though it's made for women, I think men need to read it as well because he brings up valid points about how that inward journey is so needed in order to have a fulfilling, loving, committed relationship and to indoctrinate new belief systems so that you can pass these down to your children and they can come in the world knowing that I had a mother and a father who committed to themselves first and then they're committed to each other. It doesn't mean you're not gonna have, you know, arguments and things like that. 
But the thing about it is, is that you're not so willing to walk away at the first time you have a, a disagreement that divorce is not an option. And because you've taken that inward journey to learn self. So again, Derek Jackson, don't forget your crown. Oh, oh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I'm going to go grown folks on you with a book okay. by Candace um, Carding Williams called Queenie. Um, this book is set in London, England um, with a young woman in her early 20s trying to navigate relationships let work life um ending a relationship where she's you know viewed more as for her exotic look um for her braids and her hair and her you know hips and her for her blackness and not more for um her herself so she's trying to navigate this space and how she's you know opening herself in relationships and ways of being and getting herself in and out of you know situations and having this light bulb moment and this hap um she goes to her grandparents and says you know i think i'm gonna go to seek counseling mm -hmm. um and this is what um her, her grandmother literally has a fit and like you're not gonna do this you know mm -hmm. you know but the grandfather says let her go now he said to my grandmother she stopped washing up immediately but carried on looking into the sink maybe if all our us we had learned to talk about our troubles we wouldn't have carried so much on our shoulders all the way to the grave he turned to walk out his stick hitting the floor with purpose maybe we have not learned from the new generation veronica Okay. So, you know, just getting into, um, you know, dealing with our mental health and well, overall well being, and that, you know, hey, maybe grandpa, grandpa had a bit of wisdom and say, okay, we're going to have to learn something <laughs> from this new generation. And maybe we wouldn't be um, carrying stuff on, on our back. Um, this one is um nikki a good old nothing like a good old poem to get us thinking and um straight and this one was like i think her last published publication a good cry um just you know talking about where she is you know in her life journey where she is in her work and still um um things that she wrote about, you know, friends, you know, um, she talked about that. This is what she wrote for Ruby D. I said, I met Ruby and Ozzy shortly after I published my first book in 67, they were hosting a television show and requested the permission to use a poem of mine, Nikki Rosa. I was thrilled. My immediate answer was yes. And Ruby asked how much for the permission? Are you kidding? I asked. You mean I get paid to have Ozzy Ruby read a poem of mine on television? And that was the beginning of a wonderful friendship. Ruby came to Virginia Tech about five years ago to celebrate the 100 um, best African American poems. But I cheated um, with us. And um, she and I together read the poem for Rosa Parks. I asked her agent what the billing would be. She said, Miss D would destroy me if i charged you i loved ruby for a lot of reasons but mostly because she remembered who loved and loved and who loved her who she loved and who loved her she will not be forgotten her genius her kindness her forward looking her desire to build a better future will always be with us and art is the right tool to build a future and ruby d showed us the way so you know she talks you know talks about these relationships that she has over the years then she shares you know, the poems that um, go, you know, 
go along kind of with the story. Um, she, this particular piece says, Black Lives Matter, not a hashtag. I'm not ashamed of our history because I know there's more to come. I'm not ashamed of slavery, neither um, bought nor sold because I know there is another answer. I'm not ashamed of dark or light skin, straight or curly or nappy, let's call it that, hair. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of thick or thin lips, nor that time we waste singing and dancing. We taught the white folks to sing and dance too. <laughs> I'm proud of Simon of Cyrene. Nobody made him help Jesus. He did his part. I'm proud of the woman who moaned on the ship at the 10th day for admitting if not defeat, then um, certainly change. I'm proud of the rappers who rap and it, most especially I'm proud that Black Lives Matter. We do. We honestly do. Beautiful. Beautiful. And that look, that's what look, that's it. That's a wrap for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I got I got two more and then I'm through. Um this man, I, I Andre, Andre Leon Talley, the Chiffon Trenches, this is his memoir. This is actually his second one. Um I caught one of him back in woo, probably 1980. I was in college. Um first went off to college and um picked up a magazine that I would not have normally picked up and saw his um, his critique. Um, um, he ba basically, if you, don't, if you know who he, uh, pretty much everybody knows who he is. He is like, to me, the culture critique of, of couture. He, he tells you exactly what's coming out. He shows you how to dress. He does it in such a way where, um, you think he was really born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but he wasn't. He was born, um, I'm not sure which of the Carolinas it is, but it's from one of those Carolinas. And, but the thing about it is, is that this young man, this man, as a young man, went off to school. He learned how to, to speak French fluently. Um, he takes you through his world as a black man, a tall black man, because he stands about six seven, he, um, speaking French, um, really going into a world that quote unquote wasn't made for him or made for us in general. But he comes into this world of couture, and that he loves fashion. He loves how, and and it came it stemmed from his grandmother and the ladies that he saw going to church wearing the hat, you know. Go, going to church in the South or, or and really just going to church in general for black families, you know, putting on the gloves, putting on the hats, putting on the pumps, uh, you dress, you honestly dress, you know. And so his love came from that. And so it traveled with him down through the years in school and how he was able to really look at print and color and texture and look at people's bodies to see what would, what, how they could wear a, a, a garment. But this book, I think to me goes a little bit deeper. It goes into his feeling. It goes into how he was made to feel during those moments being at the table, being the only man of color at the table. Um, sh looking at people make these decisions and at one point you could tell they tried to discount him but when he began to speak they they realized oh he knows who he is and he knows who he's what he's talking about uh pairing up and being with major you know uh, designers halston and you know just being able to be around these type of type of people that mm -hmm. he was able to gather so much information and again Still keep his humility. Um, I, I, I'm reading about six books, I think, at one time, so I haven't finished his either. But I identify with his youth as well as how some of those things that happened to him um, affected him at his, in his adult life. I think this, to me, is his his going out. Not, and, and God forbid, don't want anything to happen to this man because I still want to meet him. 
So, but it's like this tells the inside of his heart. This tells the how he felt being in the trenches and how he felt being around people that either took him for granted, didn't understand him, understood him, but maybe didn't want him to really come into that place where they were at, but he still yet made made his own niche. He made his own niche in couture, high couture, and how he traveled the world, um, and how he was able to do much with little, you know? So I, I really encourage anyone to get this book. Uh, like I said, this is his second one, uh, his second memoir. Um, and I do want to go back and get his first one. But I know for me reading this, I, I, I read it slowly because I want I really want to savor every word of it because there are great lessons in here that he comes in. He he talks about being black. He talks about being black in, in, these, in these spaces. And I believe it's his like his desire for you to understand if you're going to go into these spaces that don't really want to have you there, understand how you have to armor up, but armor up also with humility at the same time and, and, and know how to navigate that type, that type of terrain. So this is one of those books that I, I encourage anybody to, to really read if you like memoirs or autobiographies and things like that. Um, this one I read at the end of last year when no one is watching. I love Alyssa Cole. So Alyssa Cole, if you're out here listening, we want to interview you. So um, Alyssa Cole, um, she took me back to when I was graduating from grad school. And one of my professors um, told me about, and that was the Clinton administration told me about what was happening like in, I, I say in the ATL, so the West End area, which is a predominantly black area. And she, he told me about how the property over there was going to get bought up. Now this is back in, 19, in, the, in the late, well, the, the mid to late 19, uh, 1990s. And he told me that the only thing that, pe that people had to do was to come in and just pay the property tax and they would own the land. Um, and I, I listened to him and I should have heeded his warning um, because he was trying to help me to acquire land over there because he didn't want the land to go out of the uh, community. Uh, and so I didn't do it. And so now we're looking at regentrification and that's what this book deals with. It deals with Regentrification and how those houses, the property is being bought and how they are refurbishing and refabricating those wonderful homes and buying up the property in our, in, in, in our communities. Uh, but it also is a thriller at the same time, because what she does is that those people that have been in, in those communities for so long, they're, they're starting to go missing. It's like one day you see Miss Miss Sarah sitting on the stoop, and then the next day her place is bought, and she's gone. No word, nothing that she was leaving. She didn't mention it that day before, but she's left the neighborhood. And so it's a young lady in here who has moved back home um, due to a bad marriage. And she's moved back home and, and she's got her mother's property, a brownstone. And she she's trying to she's she, she wants to remember this place as she as when she was a young girl and, and, and how she grew up. But she's seeing it slip out of her hand and just slip away. And it's, it's, it's really doing a, a head number on her. And Alyssa Cole talks about how that really. Makes the people in the community feel to see their homes being bought and people coming in and not understanding the history of that place. And so she talks about that, but like I said, it is a thriller. And she talks about in, uh, how the people are missing and what, and what they're doing. By the time I got to the end of this book, I was sitting here going, oh my God, oh my God. I was like, I wish I had bought the property over there now when I had the, 
the time, you know, to do it and the monies to do it at the time, because it makes you think about displacement of people. And, you know, where, where are they really going? Mm-hmm. Where are they really going? So um, one last book, and it's an audible, and it's called, um, let me see here. It's called The Secrets and Lies. Uh, Blood, Secrets, Blood, Secrets, and Lies, New Beginnings. And it's about, in, uh, I'm sorry, her name is Ingrid Creighton. I just started, I'm, at, I'm almost through actually. It's an audible book, but um, it reminds me, and I'm, I'm kind of going to go full circle. She reminds me of a new Tina McElroy answer. She's a young, you know, Ingrid uh, Creighton um, wrote the book when she was um, in the hospital, actually, and she was uh, diagnosed with cancer. But she kind of goes back, but yet she she's here in the in the in 2021 with how this family um, has grown up with these giftings, and she bring and she has it in this setting, but she gives you the generational backdrop of where they come from. So she's the, to me, like the new Tina McElroy answer of 2021. So I would encourage you to go and read it or go and, and listen to it. Um, Cause it really is a, it's an excellent book that really talks about how giftings in families where we have people who make herbs and, um, but yet and still she, you know, the, the, the young, every young girl in the family has gone to Spelman they pledge Delta. Um, they they have uh, family friends who are of other sorority. They have an aunt in, in another family who who is a Zeta, you know. And so she 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 brings a lot of the of the culture in this book, but she also talks about the giftings of these sisters. And the premise of the book is. Do you use your gifting to get revenge or do you allow the Lord to revenge, to, to get that revenge for you? So it, it, it just it just gives you a, a, a it, it kind of makes you think a little bit. You know how we talk about in the church that we have different giftings and anointings and things of that nature. But it's also how, how to use those gifts wisely and to understand who gave you those gifts. So. Again, it's like I said, it's, it's she's the. She reminded me so much of Tina McElroy Anza. I was like, wow. I was like this whole new generation of coming in now and bringing in a whole new different, you know, uh, look and outtake on these giftings. So, um, again, her name is Ingrid Creighton. And that's I'm listening to her. She's on my Audible. But these are the books that I'm currently or have read, <laughs> you know. So I'm through. <laughs> I'm well, for those who are watching. And catch the replay or watching live. Um, thank you for spending your afternoon in celebration of World Book Day. Um, hopefully, you enjoyed our sharing, our talk, our highlighting, our authors, our illustrators, um, the stories, and that we just want to encourage you to pick a book, pick up a book and read. Whether it's you know. Audible has the option. You you got you know ebook versions. You know you got your hardback and your paper book. But um, pick up a book and read and be will open to you know willing to learn something new or engage into some new ideas and concepts and changes and perspective or just for pleasure itself. So. Um, definitely, this has been a great celebration of World Book Day. Um, also, an encouragement and plug um, to support your independent um, bookstores owners <laughs> out there. And here in D.C., we've got Sankofa, which is right across from Howard University. And then we've got Mahogany Books. Um, Shout out to Derek and Ramunda who are out there in Anacostia section of DC and who are getting ready to open a second location. And we're so excited about the second location because 
it's going to be closer to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm yeah. real excited about what um, the bookstores in the DC um, metropolitan area. And there's another one that I'll probably just post um, in the group. We may just do a page, you know, during this month, just highlighting, um, Mm -hmm. You know, our independent um, bookstores in the area. I'm going to do bookstore at Greenbrier Mall. <laughs> <laughs> so just so that, you know, people know where, you know, where they can, you know, find, you know, good books, good literature, mm -hmm. good, I mean, everything. Because our yeah. bookstores tend to have everything. They yes, have everything. They, they have everything. You can get some candles and some soap and a journal <laughs> and, yeah. and all, all that. <laughs> you know, at our bookstores. Yeah. So we thank you for spending this afternoon with the far side. Enjoy the trip. Enjoy the ride. And as we always say, many roots, many voices are a part of the infinite story. So plant your seed. Blessings and peace.